Hello and welcome to this episode of Shim on Ops. Today I have the honor to host Ariel Asaraf, the CEO and co-founder of Coralogix, a company in the observability space. So let's get started. Hi Ariel, how are you? Hey, what's up Shimon? How are you? It's so great to see you with us. Hey, I've been waiting a long time for this interview. How Thank you for having me. Great. So could you please introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, I'm um, Ariel, a CEO, co-founder here at Coralogix. Um, like you mentioned, a company in the observability space that analyzes all data in stream. Cool. So there's a lot to unpack on in that space. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you know the the observability uh, landscape because I feel like this is you know there are like more than 50 companies only when I go on a show floor at reinvent I see 50 right yeah. and I think that I'd love to hear from your side how do you define the problem that you're solving and better on like how do you see this evolve because this is not a new problem yeah so yeah I think interestingly, and, and, and you mentioned it correct, there are, there are a bunch of different companies doing observability. I think the, one of the main reasons being it's, it's a really big problem that, that, that a lot of engineers really face. And so engineers, you know, by nature, they, they tend to try to solve problems. And when they face a problem over and over again for a, a long period of time, the odds of some of them trying to go and solve it in a different way are, are pretty high. And so... We're seeing a lot of companies attacking this from various directions. If you try to go into um, observability as a whole, like a full stack observability platform, you'll, you'll see a, a much smaller number of companies probably if you're looking into companies that are solving both logs, metrics, tracing, APM, security, serverless, and so on and so on. Um, because the, the, the breadth of the platform is, is just huge. And there are like a, probably like 10 companies that are, that are strong in that domain. So, you know, when I think observability, there are so many things that come up. You know, there is monitoring and logging and tracing and debugging. And so, so how do you, do you scope that and, and how does Coralogic play on those verticals? Yeah, one of the hardest parts in observability is that there's just so much, right? And it feels like the world is getting less tolerant for point solutions or even if we you know, frame it in a more positive way, the world is less accepted, acceptive of uh, best of breed solutions. Everyone are looking for a single platform, having everything in a single place. And then if you as a company at that, you know, moreover as a small company, if you try to solve that by just developing separate different products and you're going to find yourself developing a tracing product, a logging product, the metrics product, the serverless product, SIM is becoming part of observability now. And so you got to offer some level of security and out of the box alerts and, you know, the list goes on. If you try to go there, it, it, it'll take you, you know, an infinite amount of time, not to mention the scale issues, support issues, compliance issues associated with observability, just to get the compliance that we need to be a company that's able to sell. And that, that includes PCI, HIPAA, SOC 2, Type 2, ISO, soon FedRAM, all these, they take a lot of time and effort. And so our way of solving this was thinking, how do we build a platform that can accept any data type and analyze any data type? And then when we add products, we just build the user interface for these products. Um, so the data processing will look the same. The query engine will look the same. The alerting engine will look the same. The visualization will look the same. We only build specific use cases, so integrations, uh, specific features, new alert types, and then it makes the development much easier. So we only sold logs up to a year and a half ago. And then within 18 months, we have six different products now. We have wow. logs, metrics, tracing, SIM, CSPM, and we've added now serverless monitoring. And wow. all of that within 18 months, not because we're that fast, but because it was all built on the same foundations that we started with. So, so could you, like, we are now, the year is 2023. If you could scope the, the, the area of, of the current solutions, because let's say I run on AWS, GCP, 
Azure is super popular now with, you know, open AI, APIs, everyone's certainly suddenly using Azure, you know, and, and all of the cloud vendors, they have built in metrics. On the one hand, you can use the cloud watches of the world and so on. On the other hand, you have like the data dogs of the world that also like huge platforms that have everything in them. Could you maybe paint the, the current map as you see it of the, the possible solutions that customers use today? Yeah, so I think um, for, for large corporates, call it Fortune 100, I think Splunk was always the default. Um, is it still? Is it, is it still something that is there? It is still. I think for financial organizations, Splunk has some benefits that other, other companies are struggling to face. We only closed the gap on most of them about six months ago. Um, there's there's a lot of depth in Splunk, and that's because where I don't see startups like using Splunk. You know, no one, almost <laughs> no startup will use Splunk, but it's still the highest revenue company in the space, almost double than the closest one. Um, so they're larger than Datadog. Splunk is almost double Datadog. Splunk wow. is three and a half billion, while Datadog is two billion, um, wow. and they're growing almost like 25, 30% a year. It's, it's, a, it's a successful company still. Um, we're just, you know, in our space of startups, cloud native, and we just don't see Splunk anywhere. So we assume it's dead, but it's, yeah. it's being dead. And it's, it's a pretty good product. Um, Datadog came with another approach of like multi, multi product. I think their depth is a lot, uh, they're a lot more shallow than Splunk and even Sumo or other products. They're just, a variety of different products besides I think probably the inframetrics and APM are their stronger parts and the rest is pretty shallow. And then they, they land really well with smaller organizations and try to grow with them. Now, obviously as they became a giant, they're now targeting larger organizations, but I think it's, it's my opinion, depending on a use case, some areas are sort of falling short. So we know that for instance, for the logging space and even the security space that they just started we feel like their product is, is far behind Splunk, Sumo, even CoreLogix by far. Um, but again, they have very good infra monitoring and APM. Then there's um, Sumo that I've mentioned, which is mainly text, and they're doing it well, mainly security. They try to be the sort of Splunk uh -huh. on cloud. But what happened there is that Splunk oh. went to cloud itself, and you know, so it made their lives harder. And of course, Elastic and Grafana are coming from the Elastic used to be open source, coming from the open source and community angle and then upgrading to subscriptions, cloud services, and so on and so forth. And, and they've gained some serious traction over the past few years. And, and how does the, the cloud vendor explain it? Because maybe I guess if many companies have like more than one cloud vendor, then in a way, like you're forced to not use CloudWatch or um, Google solution or Azure solution because they don't support one another? A few things. One, you're right. If you're multi-cloud, if you're hybrid, you have a problem there. Um, if you're using third-party solutions, it doesn't even have to be multi-cloud or hybrid. You're using a CDN. You're using an external API. You want to log these things. It's harder. But beyond these things, I think the cloud providers are very, very good platform builders. They're not very good product builders. And so when it comes yeah. down to the experience you get with Stackdriver, the experience you get with CloudWatch, the experience you get with Azure Analytics, it's, it's, it is very far from many of the companies that I've mentioned. And of course, you know, not my non-objective opinion, far from CoreLogic. So we're seeing companies typically start with them because it's kind of simple, but then it, hit a, it hits a wall very fast. I think they're going to invest there and they're going to invest heavily, but I, I, I still think that their skill set is in the, those companies that are so tuned to operations and scale that their ability to figure out use cases and product and user experience are, are much more limited. Okay, and before we move to what's unique about your solution, one other angle that I wanna ask about is the buy versus build. So do you see like organizations that go like, yeah, we're a Kubernetes shop, we're gonna you know, set up Prometheus and configure Grafana dashboards. Yeah. Like, what do you see in that area? So we see a lot of it, actually. Um, again, engineers like to solve their own problems. Um, but there, there are several issues with that. First of all, many times it falls short and it falls short in, in, in features, compliance, scalability. And then at the end of the day, once the company grows enough, you don't want to be the head of DevOps team that 
had Grafana and Elastic crash in the middle of a huge crisis, right? I mean, no one wants to yeah. be that person because it's it's the eyes of the company, it's the compliance of the company, it's part of the cost of doing business. And so companies start to understand that also you become the, the owner of the data, which is a risk in itself because I'm, I'm signing a DPA with my customers. I'm owning and I'm protecting the data. Now you have this huge data set that you're the owner of. Um, and so companies typically when they reach scale, they do either a, a complete switch to a commercial solution or one of the cloud solutions like you mentioned, or they, they'll go and put the high value data at a commercial solution and keep mm. just the low value data on the cloud or their homegrown solutions. Okay, so it's a very crowded space. <laughs> it's like uh, the reddiest, the, the most red ocean I've seen. So what makes Coralogic unique? What makes you shine? And if you can share a little bit of stats about the company and yeah. the stage, it will be great. So Coralogic is already sort of scale. We're 300 people, over 2,000 customers, um, tens of millions in revenue, including today, we, we actually just broke 10 out of one, Fortune 100 companies using Coralogic. Congratulations. So we're starting to push higher and higher uh, and, and getting some really nice traction in enterprise and, and financials and so on. I think one of the main advantages is that when we looked at into the space and there, there are advantages and disadvantages in red ocean versus blue ocean, the, the advantages, you look at what exists over there. And first of all, you know that they're spent. Only public companies, only reporting public companies, we know almost $10 billion of spend go to observability. So you just look at Datadog with two billion and Splunk with three and a half and Sumo three hundred and you know New Relic and Elastic almost a billion and and Dynatrace over a billion and uh, AppD and so on. So you know there's, there's money. money. There's money in the market. And you know what feature sets everyone are offering. So you can kind of find your you way. You reverse engineer. You like you reverse engineer how to be the best in a way. Exactly. Exactly. It's, a, it's, it's like, like a, the last last mover advantage in a way. Maybe. Exactly. Everyone talk about the second mover advantage. How about the 15th mover advantage? You look at a lot of companies and you see what's missing. But then it's these these competitors. So people used to compete with like tech giants of 100,000 employees and a young startup comes in and do something differently and wins. But it doesn't work like that with New Relic or Datadog or even Splunk or Elastic because these guys, they're fast. They're, they're good in R&D. And so if there's a new feature or a new thing that you do that's good, they're going to do the same within a couple of months. If eBPF is hot now, you'd expect startups to be the first? No, it was New Relic being the first. They bought Pixie and they were actually the first to release something that's scalable and that can work for eBPF. And so, so how what do, do you do? What do you do? How do you compete? So we, we try to figure, and we did a lot of research, what is the biggest pain point that customers are experiencing in this space? And one thing was um, scale. And we mentioned, you know, issues of performance and, and coverage and so on. The second one was cost. And the third was data correlation. And then we thought, okay, those are three very big problems to solve. Scale, and we do about 10 gigabytes per second coming into CoreLogix today. So... And we're tiny, you know, compared to, so how do you win at scale? How do you win in performance? And then how do you win at price? This is a heavy cost of goods business. It's not like, a, you know, you spin a couple of Nginx with a web app. This is, you're holding terabytes and petabytes of data. It's, like an, it's like an ed tech company in exactly. a way. So you expect a very low margin, right? Yeah. But then we figured, what is the barrier for all these things? And we found that the storage slash index layer is the barrier. Why is it? It's the most expensive part, hardest to scale part, the most fault, not fault tolerant part, because if the storage goes down, nothing works. All the alerts, all the dashboards, all your searches, everything's dead. And that's the, the biggest um, problem of data correlation because you'll have one database for logs, one database for metrics, one database for traces. So you'll have your whatever Elastic open search for logs, you'll have your Prometheus, Grafana, Influx, whatever you want for metrics, and you'll have your uh, uh, whatever ClickHouse DB for traces. And then how do you correlate? You got to kind of query and, and, and connect them and then refer from one to another. 
And then you're stuck. You're stuck. Those that storage layer gets you stuck on price, performance, scale, and data correlation. So we figured if we can eliminate that layer, what do we get? And we created uh, Streama. Streama is our technology. is based on Kafka. Uh, basically, it's Kafka streams with an embedded DB in it. And each and every one of our services knows how to write a in a very efficient way to write the state that it needs to analyze the data long term into that embedded DB. And the embedded uh -huh. DB knows how to recover and how to re uh, recover from the bin log and it's completely sharded and so on. And so what happens is I can now analyze logs, metrics, tracing, security information, whatever, in real time, in Streama, including stateful stuff, not just stateless. So not just transforming, enriching, parsing, extracting metrics from, from records and so on, but also detecting alerts, detecting anomalies, data clustering, and so on. And the way that we've done that is we call it the 3S uh, architecture, uh, store stream sync. So uh -huh. all the external databases and data sources and machine learning models, they have the user definitions or models that they built. They sync it into those embedded DBs within the stream. Mm -hmm. And then you stream the data. The services add the context and state, they, state that they need. They do the checks of anomalies and data clustering and categorization and alerting and so on. And whenever an event enters a stream, you never have to leave the stream for anything. You never have side effects. You don't need to go from, okay, I need to check this against the user definition in MySQL. I need to check it against the alert that I store in Redis. No, everything is in sync. And even if those side effects are down, Interesting. I, the only thing that happens is that I'm less in sync, like I'm five minutes lagging the user alert definitions or parsing definitions or latest machine learning models. And when we built that, customers came in and said, well, what if I just want to query the raw data and I don't want to analyze and get insights? So we created the other side of CoreLogix, which is called Data Prime. Data Prime is a remote query engine that we built it's uh, based on Data Fusion and Apache Arrow. And we're, by the way, the, the largest contributor to, to Data Fusion. Nice. And what we can do now is we can in stream prune and shard your data to your own S3 bucket or whatever remote storage you give us in a columnar format with inverted index with a bunch of different methods that we created there for performance. And then create your own remote archive directly for logs, metrics, and traces, and security information. And then you get infinite retention. We do both schema on write and schema on read. And we cost about a third of our competitors. Wow. We don't store anything for you. Show me, show me. I want to see. I want to okay. see. So let, let's bring up your screen. I got to say, it, it's like an eye candy. It looks so nice. I like it yeah, so much. So I'll, I'll do a quick boat tour and then I'll just hop to the very interesting things. First of all, logs, metric tracing, and security events, everything is tracked over here. I'd like to start from, I'll, I'll show two ways of starting an investigation. I like to go to the APM part, look at all my services. I have SLIs, SLOs defined. So I see that I have on my front end, I see all the connections between the front end and different services. I can see an overview of the error rate and, and latency and P95 latency and so on. But then I can go to specific SLIs that were breached. If I see something that's breached, I can go to my actions, see what actions have the highest uh, error rate, for instance. So I see that my checkout service is having some issues. So I'm going to go and load all the traces from that and then go to a problematic trace. And when I load that trace, I'm going to see the full trace map. I'm going to see the actual error that hit me up over there. Nice. You see my screen now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm asking for related data. And this is part of correlation. So I'm going to give you related logs. Because that's you one can... of the problems. You want to connect the dots, when you, especially when you're investigating. You want to understand the whole picture. Exactly. So I came in from the very high-level service view into the SLOs, SLIs that I breach, into the actions, into the trace. Then I'm getting the related logs. And I can set up multiple level of correlations here from logs into traces. And then I can ask for the pod metrics and stats. Wow, so let's see how so pods are performing. And then I can ask for the host. So show me if I have 
you know, infrastructure issues affecting the uh, transactions. So that's one way to start an investigation. By the way, directly from here, if I want to completely start investigating and debugging this, I can just open up the log query. So I can go here and oh, start. Oh, and you can see the logs from wow. So so we have like a multi-layer. So so that's one of your, I guess, from my understanding, right? This is one of your killer features because you're saying not only that I'm gonna give you a like a cost-effective solution, I'm gonna reduce your time to actually investigate and understand what is going on because I'm gonna cool. give you cross cool correlations correlation. from the entirety of your stack. Exactly. Now correlation is. There's one way of correlating, of referring, which is what I've shown. There's another correlation of displaying. So CoreLogic's dashboard are unlike others. When wow, you it's so fast. It's super fast. And I'll show you something in a minute. It is when you create a chart in CoreLogix, you yeah. can actually add another chart. And when you add that other chart, you can pick different types, whether it's logs, metrics, or spans. So you can have one chart with three series. One will be the error rate, the other will be the CPU, and the last one will be the latency from spans, all on the same graph. So that's another way of correlating. And the, the last way of correlating, which is unlike any other solution, is flow alert. So you'd be able in CoreLogix to create a flow so that you can start from the, um, let's say, high pod C, uh, uh, CPU okay. or let's say memory. So you had high GC or high CPU. Mm -hmm. And then after an hour, your log data this time has an increase of 5XX or 4XX, or you have- Oh, it's like a smart alert that, that you can- Exactly. You can and combine that, several signals in, in different points. Signal signals and, and ser several signals of different types. And that created slow traces. And that affected your e-commerce ratio of visitors to buyers that now drop below mm. 1%. Now, this is an alert you can send anywhere with whatever webhook you want. And the cool thing here is that nice. you're going to understand the root cause. So not just you have slow traces. Hey, you have slow traces because you have a lot of 400s because this machine is loaded and you need to scale it. And the last way to go top down is to build our data maps. Data maps are multi-layer ways to look at, so you see, it's like a GIS. So I see, for instance, if I go to the UA, US, I see everything's green and I'll show the criteria in a second. If I zoom in, I'll see the cities. If I'll zoom in, I'll see the products. So I see the hairdryer is yellow. Why is it yellow? I can investigate and I'll see that it crossed the bar that I've defined. What it's is like that? A, I, I don't like it. Like, uh, it looks very nice, but I mean, like, the approach, I guess it's for knock people that sit and look at a huge screen. Like, it's not the approach I believe in, but it looks really nice. So the thing is that sometimes, you're right, by the way, this is like why it's called a data map. It's like for a high-level view yeah. sometimes. But sometimes, you know what? I'm going to go here and change the criteria. So I'm going to color every, anything above 200 in, in yellow and above 300 in red, for instance. And I'm going to apply, oh, 120. And I'm going to apply this. What did I do wrong? Oh, yeah. Let's call it 500 and then 700. <laughs> now, I have all these colors here, right? Mm -hmm. But what I can do here is I can change the, the way that I look at the data. So I can say, you know what? Show me this on the host level or show me this on the method level. And then I can see what post looks like. Mm. And I see that Ashbourne, this city has slow responses for post actions. So makes sense. it's a way for you to kind of flip the data. But the nice thing is, again, you can come here and tell CoreLogix, you know what? Show me. The related logs yeah. show me the spans. So you can very, very quickly hop uh, whenever you want between the different data types. That's that's what's so special about that it. That is so cool. So cool. Okay, so I have two more questions. Number one, you talked about that one, you know, AWS also really loves to do it, to say like, we're going to have a service is going to be three times the, the, the cost or 10 times cheaper. So how much does it cost and how does your pricing structure work? 
So the cool thing is that in CoreLogix, unlike other solutions, you can pick how you want to analyze your data. So when you go to CoreLogix, you don't just say, okay, I'm using CoreLogix, I'm going to digest all the data. You go to the TCO optimizer, mm -hmm. and whether it's logs or traces, metrics all go directly to the archive. You can pick if you want to frequently search it, if you want to monitor it, so all the real-time detections, and then put it on your archive, or you just need to put it in your archive for search. So I'll go here, and they find a policy for all the logs of these applications, these subsystems, these severities, or the spans. Give them, block them entirely. I don't want to pay. Just write them in the archive for queries. Oh. Monitor them in real time or store them. And then mm. I can even pick the archive retention. So other solutions, you buy retention, right? Here you pick the retention you'd like. And, and I pay by, by, by the availability of the retention. Exactly. Now, the cool thing is for one unit of CoreLogix, which will cost you like what others will sell you as a gigabyte, okay? Mm -hmm. You'd get three gigabytes of monitoring, nine gigabytes of compliance. You'll get 30 gigabytes of metrics. Just to give you a comparison, um, a gigabyte of metric at a leading APM in the market costs 30 cents. Okay, at the largest uh, metrics and in infra monitoring, it'll cost you about 50 cents. In CoreLogix, it's three cents. Wow. So we're talking like a tenth of the And cost. you know, I love it because it's not like you're cheap. It's because you built a great technology that allows you to be cost effective. And I think that this is the name of the game, specifically with our market now and specifically with those types of solutions. Because at the end of the day, it's like... A, you know, it's a hole that can, it can tear a hole in your pocket yeah. in terms of pricing. And many times you don't even use it. So you give the granularity and the ability to pay for what you Decide actually want, want and need. And now the cool thing is our margin is not far from the, the greatest public companies in our space. So we're, we're good, even at this pricing level. And I want to show you what I talk about when I say technology. So comparing this on the CoreLogix dashboard is easy because, you know, you don't have anything to compare to. But... You can plug CoreLogix to, like you see, OpenSearch, Grafana, Kibana, mm -hmm. Jaeger, Tableau. So because we're not dependent on a schema, we can transform to whatever syntax. You can oh. use our syntax, Data Prime. You can use Lucene, PromQL, SQL, Regex, whatever. So now I want to go to Grafana. And you've seen Grafana in your life, I guess, a few times, of right? Course. I'm going to take my simple Kubernetes metrics, host metrics uh, dashboard. It's like eight figures there disks, network, memory, CPU, load, okay? Three hours, load pretty fast. Let's do 24 hours. Let's do 30 days. Let's do six months. So, so like the solution comes with a pre-built Grafana that I can use? Yeah. Oh, I think so you're, saying, you're saying you don't have to only use our proprietary dashboarding. We can also export your data to the tools that you love. Exactly. Oh my God, this is so awesome. You said, because you said, right, build versus buy. Yeah. You don't have to, you don't have to think about this anymore. Wow, that is so Kibana, crazy. You can use Kibana, you can use my dashboards that I've shown you before. It doesn't matter to me. Amazing. Okay, final question, Ariel. So uh, for people who want to get started for startups, how do they get started and what do you offer when, get start, when people get started in testing your solution? Yeah, so first of all, very easy to get started on your own. You don't need us. You go to the website, you sign up, you get an account, you get a private key. There are 150 different integrations, super simple. There's actually a video of our dev relation guy making a full integration through Kubernetes cluster, logs, metrics, and traces within eight minutes and having everything streamed. Nice. Um, we give a very extended trial. We give 21 days of eight gigabytes per day. So a nice trial for a company. And then of course, you know, if you have bigger needs, Pricing is depending on your sizing and you get, by the way, CoreLogix gives for its clients 24-7 support. This is something that's unmatched. 24-7 support, committed on contract in under two minutes, okay? And our actual stats are 15 seconds to respond and 50 minutes to close a ticket on average. <laughs> so if someone wants to start and grow with us, you know, someone will speak to him and, and, and it's very easy to onboard. And you can start just with the logs, just with the metrics, just with APM, and then Amazing. obviously. Okay, this is so awesome, Ariel. Thank you so, so much for this great 